Please welcome our next speaker. Please stick around after this session for a live Q&A. Hey folks, welcome to Dynamics Con. We are here once again. Uh, Jason and I are very happy to be here. And to the organizers, as always, thank you so much for having us. I love this event, personally, I've, I've done a few of them. So yeah, uh, again, thank you, right? So let's get into some intros. Who are these crazy people talking to you? Jace? Absolutely. Thank you. And likewise, thank you for uh, for the invite and uh, absolutely love the branding of this Dynamics Con. I'm Jason Earnshaw. Uh, I'm a loco general manager here at the ANS Group, working alongside Chris. Chris? I am definitely the less pretty, less intelligent version of Jason working at ANS. So my focus is primarily on the technical side of low code. And yeah, we're going to be talking a lot about Power Platform today. And uh, we've got a bit of a spin that we're going to put on it. So the session title is Architecting Ecosystems and Low Code World Building. Now, because this is Dynamics Con, I think uh, we take the spin on a superhero journey, which is going to be pretty fun. And we've, we've selected somebody pretty specific, hey, eh, Jace? Absolutely, absolutely. One of the favorite superheroes. But uh, it was fun putting this. It was fun putting this presentation together. I think uh, we came up with some crazy ideas. We wanted to work out our superhero journey it was the same as a low code journey. We've managed to accomplish that. We want to assemble the superheroes and uh, and let's get going. Absolutely, man. So let's fire on all cylinders. Absolutely. Let's let's jump in. Let's jump in. So first of all. What is a low-code ecosystem? And what a lot of people think a low-code ecosystem is, is just a number of projects. And what projects are? They're solutions, they're apps, they're things that people are building to solve business problems. But as we all know, low-code is way more than just building solutions. There's more to the ecosystem than just solutions. And Microsoft call them projects for some reason. We call it portfolio. But ultimately, that is the important part of low code. And Chris, what's what's one of your famous sayings with low code and uh, and projects and oxygen? Oh yes, absolutely. So apps are uh, oxygen for ecosystems. That's my I, I love that one actually, and it's so true, right? If you if you think about the whole concepts of what an ecosystem is, so yeah, tell us more. Absolutely. So as we said, projects are the ecosystem for uh, or are the uh, are the oxygen for the ecosystem. But there's more to it than just projects. Once you've worked out your projects, you've got your platform. You need to make sure that you've got the right guardrails around the platform so people aren't just building things and putting your business at risk. But employing that guardrails around the platform is really important. That's one of the Ps. There's four Ps in total. Once you've got the projects and you've got the platform locked down, you've then got the people. Who are your projects? Who are your solutions built for? Who are going to be using your solutions? Who's going to be building your solutions? Who's going to be supporting your solutions and your platform? Also, people is probably the hardest P. That is where you're convincing people that low code and adopting an ecosystem is the way forward to modernize the way that they work. Once you've, once you've got the projects, the platform, and the people engaged, you then need to start thinking about your processes. How can you actually repeat and standardize and put some best practices in there so everybody's building in a controlled manner and following the same processes and things like that? And when we're actually coming up with the word ecosystem, it seems a little bit out there, but what we're all kind of doing with, with, with merging our two worlds together, Chris, uh, basically we came up with, is it a framework? Is it a center of excellence? No, it's more than a framework. It's more than a center of excellence. Yeah, because it's an ecosystem. And what we saw was that a framework is more like a fixed mindset. It's it's a fixed, rigid scope that you just, once you've hit, you can't grow outside of. And with a low-code ecosystem, it's more like a growth mindset. Yeah, you're constantly adding on more jigsaw pieces or more Lego bricks into your ecosystem to actually grow that out. And we thought that was actually quite a, quite a, quite a good way to think about it. And that image there that I saw on LinkedIn uh, a couple of days ago just sums it up quite well. And when you actually look at what growth mindset and what fixed mindset is, it was actually quite interesting that everybody that's adopting low code, you are in the growth mindset bracket. You're embracing challenges. You're training your brain to get to get better things and solve the problems better. You're learning from feedback, and you are inspired by what other people are doing to succeed. It's brilliant. Everybody that's not using low code, you're a fixed mindset. What do you think, Chris? 
Oh, bro, I'm just wondering, was that a growth mindset that got you that hoodie? Because goodness me. <laughs> yes, yes. These were my day. These these were my days at uh, working for Mendix. It was uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a low code hackathon. <laughs> I love it. Uh, listen, it's not the most diabolical hoodie I've seen you wear, but it's up there, and, and you're absolutely it's a little right. bit like Colour, the colourful jacket that you're wear, that you're wearing there as well. But we get asked a lot of questions, Chris. Is a low code ecosystem is it the same as a, as a, as a centre of excellence? What's what's your answer to that? Oh, my friend, this is probably the most asked thing. Do you remember when we stuck that post out on LinkedIn? And everyone was like, so I rebranded my title to ecosystem architect. And then we got Craig White's on board and he was an ecosystem architect. And then a few other people changed their names. And then our pal Yannick actually was chatting about it as well. So I have to categorically tell you that absolutely not. An ecosystem is not the same thing as a center of excellence. Now, I do have to tell you that every company in the entire world has a digital ecosystem, whether they like it, know it or not. All right. And it's happening. Okay. An ecosystem is effectively the thing that kind of the technology and the people and and the processes and the portfolio, and I can't think of another word with P other than pudding, but anyway, <laughs> it's where those things live, right? And the digital ecosystem is effectively where people work. Now, I earlier said that portfolio or apps are oxygen for ecosystems. And that's very true because the more things you have that people can use, the bigger your ecosystem is. And you're absolutely right when you said the word framework is, is it feels too locked down, like an ecosystem, something that grows and becomes bigger. Yeah. Now, what you will find is that in an ecosystem, you might have multiple centers of excellence. Now, some people call them COE, center of excellence, centers of awesome, centers of enthusiasm. Literally, I can come up with loads of other things that fit in that acronym. But you may have more than one center of excellence. And let me give you an example. You might have Power Platform in your business, and you might have the center of excellence starter kits installed, which means you only have the technology. It does not mean you have the process, the people, or the portfolio to support your center of excellence, but you also might have Salesforce and Oracle and SAP. And do they all obey the same rules? Absolutely not. Your center of excellence, may be, there may be multiple COEs in one ecosystem. What you may also find is you might have what you call a federated center of excellence, where you have a primary with lots of secondaries. And those COEs are broken up into what we call communities of practice. So people actually doing the thing. And much like um, when Thor battled Thanos, uh, that is like doing the thing, right? That's, that's making sure that you do the thing and deploying, really. And then you might have business units part of these communities of practice. Now, that's all good and well. But remember something, folks. Because you are in one ecosystem, there is often one set of guardrails, or maybe multiple. But if you're looking at Power Platform, there's still one real set of guardrails. And that's normally controlled by IT. Here's a fact. Did you know that IT are their own center of excellence, right? And they're officially one kind of group of people that will do things. And the communities of practice may grow out of IT. And, Jace, you know, thinking about and speaking about these communities of practice, I think it's probably a good idea to start thinking about, well, what does the end game look like for these COPs? Like what actually does it, how, do, how does it build? How does it form? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we always like to start start a movie showing you what good looks like. And ultimately, we had to bring it back to the superhero world. Yeah. And this this is very interesting. As, as you see, you see a number of different superheroes here. Um, and each of these are essentially like a different department within your organization or a different different region or a different country. Whatever it is, they're all fighting and wanting to solve their own projects and battles. Okay. So and what we mean by that, we've thrown a little bit of fun on here and we've 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 made we've we've made iron man it because he's always kind of like building tech for other people we've made hulk hr because he likes smashing things up i don't know if that's the right analogy to use there chris but uh, it was very interesting <laughs> absolutely it was very interesting when you look at this they are all individual departments all got their own movies all trying to fight their own battles but ultimately they can all come together and they can all learn from each other and they all celebrate success with each other as well so as we move on is a actual loco customer journey the same as a superhero journey can they actually be the same what do you think chris you know what? Actually, I think they probably could, right? I'm still can't get over the fact that you made Hulk HR. Like that is going to stick in my brain, right? <laughs> but I think we think you're right. I think they are probably pretty similar. And actually, yeah. you know who's figured that out? A lot of the vendors like Mendix and, of course, most importantly, Microsoft. So Microsoft did something very cool. Before, when we used to talk about low code and power platform, they would say, 
apps, 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 like everything was just about apps. And then people like Manuela Pickler joined Microsoft and other people from various other areas of, um, of the, the wider power platform ecosystem. And they came up with this very cool thing. And it's called the creator manual. Now, don't let the name put you off because it's not just about creating. What they mean here is by building the ecosystem or building the low code world within a business. And actually, what's quite cool about this manual is that there are a set of steps and procedures that you can follow. And they've got these three steps, which are really interesting, right? The first step is about getting ready, figuring out what your first apps are. Now, I know I'm using the word app very kind of openly, but it's a solution. It's never just an app, Jace. I don't know. Have you ever just built one app before? Not really. Not really. No, uh, me too, man. It's always like a collection of stuff, right? So these, these things, these solutions are typically good ways to begin and building relatively small things, which we'll talk about a little later, by the way. The second thing is, well, how do you move out from getting ready to being set? Like what, what other things should you focus on? And in the portfolio, you may be focusing on things that are a little bit more mission critical. So stuff like incident management, et cetera, et cetera. And that's like a superhero, right? When the superhero starts out, they don't start out massive. They kind of always get to the beginning, maybe taking on the high school bully. And I know you're going to talk about that later, but then moving out into something a little bit more dangerous. And then finally, the go part. Yeah, we're ready to rock and roll. We're going to take on Thanos now. But you know what, folks? In order to do that, there's a couple of things that you need to remember, right? And that's not to just dive right in. There are actually a set of things, or the four Ps, as we like to call them, that will help you out. Now, when thinking about low code, it's never just about making apps. It's never just about your portfolio. You know, it's proven that like apps, apps solve a lot of problems, which is really key. And building those projects out, that's great because they solve the known problems, but actually the people are the most important part. People are the things or the resources or the people that drive the platform forward and drive the use of the platform forward. Now, we're talking about platforms, absolutely, Power Platform being the greatest low-code platform of all time. That's me taking a dig at Jason because he used to work at Mendix. <laughs> and yeah, used to, by the way. And the platform is effectively the set of digital building bricks that allow you to build those solutions. But also, you need to have the ability to operationally maintain that platform, right? So you need people to do that and you need people to build out the stuff. What's next? Well, process, right? Now, here's the thing. You can build in the Wild West if you really want to. You can go absolutely nuts and just create things completely from scratch. You can just really do things without having the guardrails in. But here's the point, right? The process is what drives the governance. Now, we don't necessarily like to call it process. We might say it's a safe space for makers. I'll tell you something interesting. A lot of people associate governance with process. And uh, I know you I know you laugh at this story quite a lot, but when um when I had my kids. They didn't say, hey, Chris, we're going to give you baby governance. They said, we're going to give you a safe space for your kid to mission around. And actually, what's been good here is that that's what process does in the, in the low-code platforms. It gives makers a safe space to build. And that's been hugely important to us, right? So don't think of process as something that's locked down. It really enables the organization. So people, being the people we are, building things and supporting things, the platform, providing the digital bricks, but also providing operational support. You've got the processes supporting the people on the platform, and finally, the projects that work within the entire ecosystem to provide value to the business, okay? So if we think about that a little more, how does the, on earth does this link to a superhero journey? That's a great point. And coming, coming back to this, if you, if you Google low-code journeys, these are common stages. These are, these are not just low-code. These are digital transformation journeys that you these are the things that you need to you need to incorporate for a digital transformation but how, how can how can we merge these two together and how does this actually look like a superhero journey as well so if you google or you bing this is the bit that we had some fun with just on a dynamics con style thank you again dynamics con but basically if you google a superhero journey or a hero's journey you come up with all sorts of beautiful little images here but they all look exactly the same they've all got three stages that's very similar to the to the loco journey that Microsoft and a lot of the other vendors describe. You've got three of the main phases that everybody goes through. You've got an ordinary world. That's people living in their current world, using Excel, using Access, yeah, in their boring, mundane life, thinking, how can we scale this? And then they get shown the extraordinary world. How can they actually 
move to the next level and truly modernize how they work. It's exactly the same. So we'll, t- we'll take a look at these three these three phases, and they can have 16 stages here, but a lot of these do kind of trans- tra- translate over to what Microsoft was saying in in their creator's manual with the three phases, with the three four phases there with the people, portfolio, processes, and platform. I do like this one here. This feels like our last three to six months, three three to four months together, Chris, where I've been constantly trying to pull you out of levels 501 up to levels 101 and 201, but um, it's been a fun journey thus far. So let's take... One beer, like I have one beer. (laughs) <laughs> but let's 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 take a look and let's try and let's try and uh, combine the two worlds together and take a look at how they do relate. So, a superhero journey is all about that departure. It's then the initiation and the return back to their back to their new life. That definitely corresponds with the ready, set, go that Microsoft would talk about in their creator manual. We'll then take a look at these 16 steps as well. You've got 16 steps. But again, each of these 16 steps relate to those four Ps. So you'll take a look at the hero in their natural environment. That's Spider-Man in his natural environment before he starts fighting crime and learning his powers and things like that. That's the people side of things. There's always got to be a call to action. What's that first project that you're trying to undertake? So again, call to action is project. You need to cross the threshold. You need to understand what the threshold can actually give you. That's the platform. This is an important one. Trial and first failure. Now, you don't want your first project to be the first failure, but you do need to trial and make sure that you are using the skills to your best ability to solve the problems that you can solve. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, it's it's actually really important. Um, when we start chatting to folks all over the world, it's like, you know, you may have just discovered the superpower, but yeah, don't don't bite off more than you can chew. And a lot of people think they're going to solve, they're going to boil the ocean effectively with this. And, you know, sometimes you just have to start small. You know, I, I remember when I gained my superpowers, I didn't, I didn't just jump off the roof, man. You know, I didn't just learn to fly. And uh, I just was in- incredibly strong all the time. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I wish I had superpowers. But it's really important, right? And we see a lot of organizations take on these massive things. And actually, you know what? Fail fast, right? Pick off the things that you know you can solve with the platform first and build up. And I know internally, we actually have a thing called t-shirt sizing, where we don't do anything under a under a uh, sorry, we don't we will not do anything that's higher than a medium at a first go because we know we need to prove success with this right in the beginning. Absolutely. And the, jo- the joys of low code is you can get something in somebody's hand in one to two weeks. So people can understand if that's going to be successful or not. So that's a really interesting one. Choose them right projects first. And as you go through, once you've chosen that project, once you've had success, learn how to celebrate success. Build that into your processes. And as you well know, the best way to celebrate success is with food. So bring cake. Celebrate. He sent a cake. He sent literally an entire cake to my wife, right? I don't know. That's probably because she's very successful being married to me, which is amazing, right? But I know at Mendix, right, when you were there, how many people did you send cake to? Oh, well, it, it was part It was part of our process that every customer, you went and you, you took cakes. You will see people posting cakes celebrating their first successful app. Uh, that's That's a good way to get the message out. And bring cake and let them eat while while you're showing them the awesome app that you've got. So I agree. Yeah, yeah it's 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 a great way. It's a great way. Also, then quickly looking at through a, a couple of these, you can kind of see how they're re- they're relating back to processes and platform and people. Another interesting one is taking new place in the old world. Once you've proven the success, the platform should then be your new world moving forward. Totes. Oh, dude, I just did a session on this at a, at a user group. Because we were talking about like how um, everything needs to, you know, folks will often assume like if you're from modern workplace, everything's a SharePoint list or if you're from dynamics, everything's a, you know, a dynamic solution. And actually we need to learn to cross collaborate and cross skill. And like, think about the Avengers, right? They had lots of different skills of all different types, really diverse people that were doing different things. And actually for us, it should be the same, right? We can't just use one tool to solve every problem. We have to think outwardly and actually I think like in Power Platform in general, it's a tool that allows us to do that because it comes from all the different areas of Microsoft. I'll give you an example. Did you know Flow came from a hackathon and it's actually Logic Apps under the hood? So all those tools that already exist, you know, we're making use of. And I think, you know, being part of the low code movement, Power Platform was one of the most diverse tools. So we need to take our place in the new world instead of living in this world of like, 
we only do things this way because absolutely but but like i said power power, power automate and and the, and and the bots and all of that it is an extraordinary world but it's not it's, it's not just for superheroes it's there ready for you to use so let's move on and let's start taking a one of our favourite superheroes, and yes, I had to watch every movie going. I didn't realise how many Spider-Man movies there were and different versions, but went through them all to try and relate back Spider-Man's journey to to an actual similar loco journey. So let's kind of build it out. Let's just have a bit of fun before we move on to the serious stuff and start talking about how businesses look at low code. So ultimately, we've got the three stages that uh, the, 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 the low code say, ready, set, go, start structure scale, whichever ones it is. Those are the businesses for low code. We've also then got the, low, the, the superhero journey here. So we've got the departure, the initiation, and the return. Now, as we said before, we need to understand what are the projects that Spider-Man wants to undertake first. And if he turns around and says, I want to fight the Green Goblin first, we'll say, mm, that's probably not the best thing to do. If the customer turns around and says, sorry, I've not got a clue where to start. Can you help us? Then you'll probably want to run a portfolio workshop. So if that's the case, feel free just to run a portfolio workshop to understand which ones do you do now? Which ones do you do later? Which ones do you probably need to rethink? That might not be the best way of doing it. How can we break it down into something smaller? Or which ones? Great idea. It's low complexity. Yeah, it's not very high visibility. You can probably do that one as yourself. Those are probably the smaller the smaller things that you want to do. But as this starts building out, start working with your customers to plot them on this diagram. And I know, Chris, this is kind of doing your heading because you look at it in a different way. But don't be scared about throwing things into the outbox as well. So as we're going through working with Spider-Man, he does want to he does want to fight in the end game. He does want to fight the Green Goblin. He does want to start lifting cars. Are those the first projects that you undertake? He could probably do it. I don't know if he'd succeed. So you need to start proving the value of your platform first in your newly formed skills and start taking high visible projects, but low complexity. Okay. And anything that they come out with, he might want to fly around the world. He might want to run back and, and turn back time because he's that fast. He can do it to save his uncle Ben. He might want to just build and smash things up. Those aren't really Spider-Man and they aren't the right platform for Spider-Man. So throw those out. That is a D you are not that I'm very upset right now. Superman and Flash are DC. I can understand why it's not the right platform, though. It makes total sense, man. Good work on excluding those. Absolutely. Absolutely. But once you've worked out the do nows, it's always good to try and come up with more than just one. Yeah? Try and get three to five so people are actually truly getting value of the low-code platform. So once you've got those, go for the do now. High visibility, low complexity, not a ton of integration. You're not fighting really hard battles. Yeah? You're choosing ones that are adding value. And the first candidate is he wanted to get revenge for his Uncle Ben's death. Okay, that is your first superhero project candidate. So we now understand what our projects are. He's not taking on big ones. He's going to prove the value. Now he knows that, he can work out what his platform is going to look like. Okay, so he can work out security. He needs to make sure that nobody knows who he is. So he needs to lock down his DLP rules to make sure nobody, nobody leaks out the fact that he's Spider-Man. So he cover, his mask is his DLP rules. I'm sorry. But make sure that he does actually then know his tech. And he's testing the tech out before fighting these big battles. Okay. Also, who are the people? These are people in his department. OK, these are the ones that are going to help him succeed on his journey. And also, once he's got that, he needs to then work out his processes. He needs to be agile. He can't go away for six months, think he's built out the best web web functionality that he can do to spray a web and then come out. and It doesn't quite work. He's building, trialing, building, trialing. Always try and look to use agile methodologies with low code because they just fit so well together. Once he's got that, how do you celebrate success? Spider-Man did it very well. Yeah, he went to work. He, he went to work for the for the news for the news company, and also make sure that those first three apps. What can he do to reuse? Yeah, his Spider-Man outfit was reusability. Other people then start adopting his adopting his uh, his 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 costume. So start small, get your processes right, lock down your platform, start small with your people, choose the right projects. That's the key thing, Chris. Yeah. And we see it similar in organizations. From a reusability perspective, why are you not in a skin-tight Spider-Man suit, my friend? I should be, shouldn't I? Probably not got the bot. 
Not got the body for it. Not got all the body for it. But as we as we've proven the value, you celebrated success, and we've not got a picture of Spider Man in a cake. That's a shame. I should have I should have got that. You then start looking at your four P's in your next stage on your life. Okay. So his projects. He's now fighting bigger battles. He's taking on bigger, more complex projects, and true and truly putting his platform to the test. He's looking at the platform and trying to look at new ways that he can use the platform to fight bigger and better problems, okay? He's also tapping into the data as well. He might be looking at more data things. He's starting to also look at different people into his network. So he's now starting to engage with other people in other communities, okay? And he's now starting to form part of this community of practice and the community of insights, Chris. I love this. I love how yeah. you've um, how you've included the the cool stock suit with the with the with the little legs. And um, I remember when we were chatting about this, that literally stuck out to me because you are. It's kind of like building your, you know, taking more advantage of the digital bricks in the platform. Because when he met Stark, one of the people, he kind of got all this really cool tech that was given to him, and then he really started leveraging it. And that's like AI builder and machine learning and that. If you look at Power Platform, I see what you're saying, man. Like you start out really, really simple just by making some canvas apps and that, and you move out into something a lot more complicated but way more badass. Absolutely. Is the first app that you choose with AI Builder and loads of connectors and things like that? No. But further down the line, start trialing it out and start having some battles with that with that latest technology. And then again, once you've once you're embracing that latest technology, make sure you're baking it into processes because low code is all about repeatability, speed to market, and all of those good things. Okay. So that's having a little bit of fun there with bringing a superhero journey into a low code journey. I love it. Hey, and folks, actually, if you've got any questions, fire them over to us in the chat, um, because I think that that's a really great example of how a superhero would start out. And, you know, if you think about any scenario, you can actually plug that into it. So any questions, just chuck them in the chat. We'll happily answer them as we go. Uh, and especially about Spider-Man films, Jason has promised to answer every question you ask. I've watched them all <laughs> recently, so there's nothing that I don't know, but don't test me. But anyway, Chris, how does this now link to a loco? So we've had a bit of fun there. So how can we now link this to actually a loco? Let's 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 get back to business. That's a, that's a marvelous question, Jason. Thank you for mm -hmm. asking. So this does link to low code in many ways. As you can see, you've got your three phases over there. I did that. That's three, apparently. <laughs> and what's really key is that, you know, when you start looking at the ready, set, go kind of process, right, you're going to start out with your platform. Now, most people have this uh oh moment when they discover power platform and low code. And it's kind of like when you're discovering your superpowers, right? You're like, why is this happening to me? I've been bitten by 16 radioactive spiders. And effectively, when you begin, you spend a lot of time in the initial process when going through the what, what we call the platform layer. And that's really around going, okay, where do I begin? How do I educate people? How do I strategize, right? How do I set up the right guardrails? And typically, that's where you're spending a lot of time building out those procedures and setting up the baby gates so baby Spider-Man doesn't throw his baby toys down the stairs, right? And that's really important. And then as you go, well, the more you fine tune it, the easier it becomes. So there's this like peak of activity and then it kind of drops off the better you get at the processes and the better you get at managing that platform, okay? And remember- Do you normally find the peak of activity at the early stages, obviously, yeah? Oh, all the time, man, yeah, because people panic when they see it. And that quite neatly moves out into talking about the, uh, the projects that you make. And if you think about those projects, right, um, it's not always as simple as like, hey, we're just going to make one app or 60 apps. You never know. Like some people start out and say, hey, we're going to make 5,000 things like you, see, you can see in this graph. And then there's a bit of a, a dip, right? Because you have to say, listen, folks, let's not make every single possible thing you can think of using the Power Platform. Let's pick five use cases. So there'll be a dip. And then as you increase, you identify other areas where you may want to build things. And normally this is when the business really get information around what's going on. And if you think about it, right, that's quite similar to uh, the superhero journey, where when Spider-Man really starts working out like what he's going to do and who he's going to fight, he may pick out a couple of folks in the beginning that he doesn't like and then fight a couple more. And it gets a bit easier for him because he's learned how to manage his platform. OK, and this scenario, it's the same thing. There's always a big peak on the on the tech part, on the on the platform piece. And then there's a little bit of there's a bit of a dip in picking the use cases. And then eventually this like rockets off. 
And actually that green kind of chart piece over there should be shooting off the page because you can just build anything you want, right? And Chase, you've seen this in pretty much different platforms as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It is key to choose them first candidates, yeah? And what and, and the way that we used to talk about it and the way that we used to pigeon, pigeon all our customers into it is if they're between ready and set, you're kind of building your first three to five apps, yeah? yeah? And then as you're moving from set to go, you're probably moving from maybe three to probably 10 to 15 apps. You've then got your processes in place, and then after that, you're building your process, you're getting that structure in place, and then you are flying and people are building tens to hundreds of apps every year. It's absolutely incredible. And actually, this whole thing is not possible without people, right? Like you can't do anything if you don't have the right people in place. And what we normally find in most, most scenarios is that in the beginning, there's only going to be a couple of people supporting you. And if you think about the Spider-Man journey, we're right, right? Like there was um, MJ, there was Aunt May. There were only a few people supporting him in the very beginning, but then he got like way better and he started building more things and taking on more villains. And then he got Happy and um, Iron Man and the Avengers eventually. And more people were on board with his platform, right? And on board with the projects he was busy with. And it's the same scenario here. When you start building out your low code journey, it's really important to know who owns the vision. I promise you, Spider-Man had a vision. In all of those movies, he was like, I want to go and kick ass. I want to go and take names, right? And um, his plan was to get really good at it. And then as he was going, he picks off his battles, and then he had more and more people, and then his stakeholders came on board on initiation, right? And that was effectively uh, Iron Man. And it's important to own those stakeholders and make sure that they are getting visibility. And then moving up, you start building as you, building your community of practice and building out your communities with other people and growing your network. And as your network grows, the amount of solutions you end up building growing grows. But you've already set up the guardrails, which is really good. So you don't need to spend all your time setting up guardrails. You're going to spend time building useful things. And that's really important. And, you know, Jason and I, um, we're doing this right now. We're in a community, right? You watching this and, and hopefully commenting, please comment, um, in the chat are part of a community, which is really important. And, you know, we, we love the idea. We have a community at ANS called Digital Disruptors. Uh, we have a lot of fun with that, right? So it's important to know you have to bring people with you. And actually, when you look on the, the glorious interwebs on Twitter, uh, there's the group called the Power Addicts, and their motto is you rise by uplifting others. And the whole idea here is to make sure that you bring people into the community, show them the superpower of the power platform, and then bring them through the process uh, and let them build great things, right? Absolutely. Absolutely agree. The, the community piece is is what ignites everybody's knowledge yeah you all share you all share from it from each other and it's exactly the same internally at businesses too building that community sharing what other people are building i mean the amount of times that i worked for for large enterprise organizations and they built one use case i think one of them was like a, a test request app or a, an asset management app and once one area of the business saw that they wanted that exact, exact exact same app. They just copied and pasted it, changed a few little things. Again, that app was built in less than in less than a week. So it's all about sharing that knowledge and sharing your experiences within within that community. It can just help everybody else fight the same battles. Oh man! But you know what? the thing the thing that scares me here is not these three. I think these three are typically the ones that people identify. The tough part is the process piece, man. And um, it's normally the the big old weakness in most in most organizations' armor. And uh, yeah, it's important to have those processes in place. You know, uh, Danny Robert Downey Jr. Or Iron Man didn't give Iron Man that spider suit. Uh, sorry, didn't give Spider Man that spider suit without them guardrails in it. He had a little bit of control with Jarvis, right? And it's the same type of thing here. The the ability to govern or create that safe space is really important. And when you start out governance, normally it's really low. But the need for governance really picks up fast, okay? Especially with the more makers or people you get on board and the more projects you make. As I said, apps or solutions are oxygen for ecosystems. Governance is kind of the set of rules and guidelines. And uh, if you think a bit about it, you know, in, in the form of driving down a road, the only reason we don't have many car accidents is because of these basic little white lines in the middle of the road, okay? And that's guidance or governance. And it's process. We just know not to drive on the other side, hopefully, depending on which country you're in. And we have to do that in low code. We have to provide the guidance. We have to say to folks, hey, you know, stepping off the stepping out of the road or driving off road is not a good idea. You're going to wreck your car. It's going to be really hard for you. OK. And it's the same thing with Spider-Man when he was trying to bring those two ships together. It was like, ah. 
And it was tough for him, right? Because that was not something he was prepared for. So we found that the process piece is really important. And the more apps or flows or solutions you have and the more people you have, the more difficult it is to maintain and manage governance. But there is certainly a peak. And once you get it right, and once you automate and start building slowly, the easier it is. And it's very much like the digital guardrails. Get it right in the beginning. Retrofitting mm-hmm. governance later on is hard. And what do you call it, Jace? That word for gov- that thing you call governance? The adaptive governance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you call it that? Well, but, well, because as 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 you say, you do, you don't you don't want to take governance that you that you might apply to application development in your business, or you might apply specific governance to another local uh, platform in your business. Don't just lift and shift and dump it on yours. You need to make it adaptive, okay? That you're not stifling innovation within your business. So make sure that you're not just dropping governance in for the sake of it, and it's actually adapted for the tools that you are trying to actually utilize across the business. Oh, spot on, man. So let's talk a bit about how we start, right? Because I think this Absolutely. is important. How do, we, how do we get going with this? Well, first of all, we've made literally a direct correlation between the way we do things and the way that superheroes, aka me and my secret life, do things as well. Right. So first things first, on the left-hand side, weighing in at approximately six points is the Power Platform Ecosystem Journey and on the right-hand side, weighing in at a lot of awesome is the Spider-Man journey. And first things first, folks, admit you have a superpower. If you are using Microsoft Azure, if you are using Office 365, if you are using Dynamics, congratulations, you have a superpower. It's called Power Platform. It's like Microsoft knew we were going to make this correlation, right? And that exists in your ecosystem, and it's very hard to turn off. Spider-Man just couldn't turn off his superpowers. Nay, my friends, when that spider bit into him, he became Spider-Man right? And that's the thing. He got his powers. So what do you do? You get visibility. In in the low-code world, we install the center of excellence starter kit. Thank you, Microsoft. Um, And the same in the the superhero world. world. Spider-Man needs to learn and get visibility of his powers. So what does he do? He goes and flings webs all over his room. Yeah, crazy, but that's what he had to do. And everyone has to learn about their powers and get visibility of them. And that means getting educated. So you've got to learn. And, you know, Jason and I do these really fun things um, called education sessions with the, pe- with the orgs we work in, where we teach them about the things in the Power Platform that they really need to know. And not everything is found in the Microsoft Docs sites, my friends. Those are thorough. They're not always there. Okay. Now, the really tough part is once you've been educated, the big old wide world is open to you. Okay? And that's where it can be quite tough. And now that you know, I always call it eliminating, I- I'll call it eliminating the third order of ignorance not knowing what you don't know. You are now second order of ignorance where you know what you don't know. And setting that strategy is really key. Spider-Man set a strategy. He knew who he was going to, well, hopefully knew who he was going to take on. Yes, the world presented some challenges, but guess what? He had some people to help him with. But the most important part is that Spider-Man followed through, right? He used the superpowers. You can hide power platform as much as you want in your business, but that is hiding a superpower. And who knows, maybe one day you could take on a Thanos type portfolio solution with that superpower of yours. And Jace, we've seen small apps. Have you ever seen big solutions built with low code? See, yeah, see, see, see plenty of big solutions built with low code. Would you start there first? No. But as you as you as you get them skills, absolutely you can I've seen I've seen some beautiful looking solutions that you wouldn't even know that they were built on low code. Absolutely. And that's what we're saying. I think we need to change our t-shirt sizing model to having Thanos as the last one. I think, I think we should. I think we should probably do it with a superhero journey. Well, that get visibility is, it, it is a key thing. I mean, if you, if you remember last time, I think, uh, or, or on one of the Spider-Man movies, yes, I have watched way too many Spider-Man movies, but basically I think he was constantly listening to the police monitoring thing. And I think that's what probably turned him black because he had too much information overload. Make sure that you're getting the most out. Make sure you're getting the most out of that, uh, out of the monitoring tools that, that, that you've got to see what's going on and the battles that you're trying to trying to uh, attack first. We could take this so far, man. So many, yeah. so many analogies. Absolutely, man. It's scaling and growing, right? So getting ready to take on Thanos, take on that Thanos-sized portfolio solution. And with us, these six steps are six steps we use internally and with organizations to show them. Check it out. Make sure that it's there. You under, It's there. It's going to be there. It's never going to go anywhere, right? Get the visibility. Get educated. Set up a strategy. Follow through. Everyone, so many folks decide that they're going to just set a strategy and never do anything. You have to follow through because you are leaving that superpower behind. 
and then finally scale and grow. And with that, it brings us to one very last but very simple point. And Jason, I'm going to leave this to you to talk about. I think it's how we started the film. Yeah, we, 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 we've got to the end. The end game is that it's key to choose the right battles, build out, build success in, in, in your own area, but build that community of practice and interest. Bring those worlds together, share your success, success stories, celebrate together, celebrate your victories, and basically assemble all your superheroes that want to learn and embrace and basically tackle new modern problems. But most of all, though, Chris, what do we always say that you need to do? The celebrate victories. Celebrate Did superheroes do that? Celebrate with cake, my friends. And actually, this is the best. If you if you've ever watched the Avengers film, if you go to the the credits, that's the shawarma scene, right? They're actually eating shawarmas because when Tony Stark pushes the nuke, pushes the nuke back out into space, he's like lying there. He's like, hope nobody kissed me. And then he says, we should get a shawarma. I know a good shawarma restaurant, and that's actually them eating shawarma. So, Jace, as you say, buddy, celebrate with cake, in this case, shawarmas. Absolutely. I think, I think that will be the scene of our next uh, celebration with our customer, yeah? We're taking some shawarmas. Absolutely. So, to wrap up, folks, DynamicsCon team, thank you. You are awesome. Uh, we really appreciate the time. We really appre appreciate all the effort you put in. And all the folks that have gone and done stuff behind the scenes, thank you. We know it's tough. And you put up with a lot of divas like me and Jason, hey? But uh, <laughs> but also um, a massive thanks to all of you for watching. And again, you know, we appreciate the comments. And yeah, just give us uh, give us some more questions and hopefully we'll be able to answer them. So yeah, see you all soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much, all.